And I can tell you that the most discouraging thing by far has not been the outcome of the election. It hasn't been who won from the presidency down to local officials. The most discouraging thing by a mile has been the way that Christians have treated each other. Just so we're clear, the world is watching. And what the world sees is a joke. As tragic as it is, this isn't the first time that the church has acted this way. Or really just the world in general at the state of politics. It's often been this way, both here and around the world. Let me give you an example. I wrote this example, by the way, last week. It has nothing to do with any kind of subtext as to whether I love or uh, despise our new president-elect, at least who appears to be. I'm just going to tell you that before I'm about to open my mouth. Ready? Prepare yourselves. Adolf Hitler rose to power in 1933. Two years before that, Germany won the right to host the 1936 Olympics. Hitler wanted to put on the most impressive games imaginable. And the reason he wanted to do it was to show Aryan superiority over the rest of the world. He was sure that if Germany hosted the greatest games and had the greatest athletes, then he would be able to show the world that his country was better than everybody else. Why did he want this so bad? Well, simply because he despised other people. He wanted to go out of his way to distinguish his people from other people, displaying that greatness to a watching world. And while incredibly twisted and wrong... Hitler's mindset was not all that different from the one present in many at the church to whom this letter is written, the church at Corinth. You see, Paul, the writer of this book, is addressing people who are at each other's throats constantly because, amongst other things, they were bickering over who was the better leader to follow. Who was, quote-unquote, right? And who had the better spiritual gifts? I could go on. The entire book is essentially Paul addressing the many problems inside of this church. They were at war inside the church, despising one another and seeking approval from those outside who despised their religion. It had gotten so bad that we learn in chapter 1, verse 11, that some of Chloe's people had written Paul a letter saying, hey, you've got to address some of these problems. In our section today, Paul reminds the Corinthians and us that Christians are usually not the cream of the crop. And that's perfectly all right. I'll read the text again in your hearing. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 26 and reading to the end. Hear the word of the Lord. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I want to title the message this morning, Airplane, I want to title the message this morning, Good News for Losers. I think Paul is explaining this good news in three ways. He talks about, number one, who God chooses. Number two, why he chooses them. And number three, the results of being chosen. 
And here's what I think Paul wants to get across in this whole text. It's what I want to argue this morning. That God chooses losers. Losers, in quotation marks. To show that he's Lord. Now that might not initially sound like very good news to you, but I'm telling you right now, that is both one of the most comforting and most convicting truths that you will ever hear. God chooses losers to show that he's Lord. And Paul begins in verse 26 by talking about the kinds of people that God chooses. Now Paul has just gotten done proclaiming the glorious irony of a crucified king. Notice verse 25, right before our section begins, Paul says this, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The cross is something that all people naturally find offensive. That that would be the means of God's victory? It's a stumbling block to Jews and it's foolishness to Greeks. But this proves, friends, that God is wise and God is strong and God is powerful. And this broad statement in 25, that the weakness of God is stronger than men, is then applied to the Corinthians. That general statement is made specific. It is as if Paul is saying, in case you needed proof of my assertion in verse 25, we'll just, you know... Look at yourselves. This might not seem to you like the kindest thing Paul could have ever done. Isn't, isn't what the preacher, isn't what the apostle is supposed to do is say, you're all great. You're all champions. You're all kings. You're all royalty. And God is going to move mightily amongst you because God has chosen the best of the bunch. That would be kind of the American gospel. But no, Paul flips it completely on his head and he goes, hey, you want to know about the power and the also paradox of God's might? Look around. Friends, don't miss this. The gospel is good news for losers. For those that the world would seem as those who don't matter much. I don't know if you're a Christian here today. Be great if you're not. Welcome. Welcome. But I hope that if you're sitting here, you look around and go like, I don't know if I want to hang out with these people. I mean, this isn't much. This isn't all that impressive. In fact, if you're a member of this church, you should look around and go, man, I don't know that much. This isn't impressive. Now, Paul has pointed out that these people, these Corinthians, already had fellowship with Jesus. Verse 2. Now he's pointing out that they just aren't that special. And I don't know about you, but I received that as incredible news. Why? Well, because, friends, there are many people in this world with more power, with more prestige, and with more promise than myself. The same is probably true of you. The same probably goes for this church. Let me just say honestly that this church is probably never going to be known around the world. It'll probably never get the keys to the city. It'll probably never be on the front of the Chicago Tribune, not that anybody reads newspapers anyways. This church will probably never be famous. The church is the collection, verse 26, of the not many. Notice, not many wise, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. The church is the church of the not many. Now, this is important in at least two ways. Number one, this church might be the way that God desires it to be. You ever considered that? You see, you don't need a congregation full of the best and the brightest. You just need a congregation that has been bought by the Lamb. That's all you need. Now, don't get me wrong. The church should always seek to be growing. To be growing in breath. 
an in-depth who God is. But the reality is, is that there's oftentimes the tendency for a church to be enslaved to an ideal. Either a church is enslaved to what it once was. We just need to become like we used to be. Or the church is enslaved to a hypothetical future. Well, if we just did X, or if we just had Y, then we would be Z. Here's the reality. Either the church, this church, and every church, is made up of who Christ wants to be there, or it isn't. See, I've got some crazy news for you. And this message would apply to any church anywhere in the world today. This church is exactly the way God wants it to be today. I I don't know about tomorrow. And I know that there are there must be. You don't have a pastor. There's got to be going like, I did, but this, is, this can't be the way it's supposed to be. Friend, do you believe in God or not? I know it's a bold claim. I mean, most of you are probably Christians. But a lot of times Christians just don't believe in God. And we say we do. But if God is truly in control... If he knows what he's doing, then this church today, exactly the way it is, is exactly the way he wants it to be. It's the church of the not many. But here's the second thing. Not only is this church the way that God desires it to be, even though it's made up of the not many, by making it up of the not many, here's the second thing, that means that the church is also the church for the few. You see, you might be thinking here and saying, like, well, actually, I am a pretty powerful person. I don't know. Maybe you're the mayor of Chicago. Congratulations. Welcome. Maybe you're super famous, and I just don't know who you are. Maybe you're super wealthy, and I just can't tell. The great thing about the church is it's not just the church of the not many. It's also the church for those who have, quote-unquote, made it in society. And thank God, because that means that this church and every church is a church for all. My prayer for you is this. That this church would be a place for the not many. And for the few as well. You might ask the question, though, like, but okay, I I now see the kinds of people that God ordinarily chooses. The question is, why? Why did he work this way? It's a great question. That's the question that Paul will answer in verses 27 to 29. You know, do you ever just sit there, like, I don't know, on your back porch or at the dinner table drinking coffee in the morning or whatever and just kind of think, like, why did God choose me? It, it should trip you out every moment of your lives. Why? Why? Why me? Why us? The funny part is that the church shouldn't make any sense. It's not supposed to make sense. But the main answer for why God brings this group of people together, though it makes no sense to anybody on the inside or the outside, is found in verse 29. So that no human being may boast in the presence of God. Do you know what would happen if this church had a thousand members, twenty million dollars in the bank, and a preacher who was best friends with the mayor of Chicago? Everybody would go like, "I want to join that church. That totally makes sense." And by the way, this isn't a dig against the churches that, for whatever reason, in the providence of God, have a lot of people and a lot of money and a lot of prestige. God bless them because somebody's got to. But the fact of the matter is, is that. Those kinds of churches often make sense to the world around us. It's this that doesn't make any sense. Sitting on a basketball court on the probably last nice day we have in the world, spread out, doesn't look like much. No, this is the way God works. Why? So that no human might boast in the presence of God. You see, God chooses the exact opposite. 
He chooses what is foolish in the world, what is weak in the world, and what is low and despised in the world. And we're told here exactly why he does it. What does such a selection of quote-unquote losers in the eyes of the world do? It does two things according to Paul here. It shames the world, 27. And it brings to nothing the things that are, verse 28. And this is the craziness about the power of God. God uses things like this to put the shame everything that looks like it's something in the world. Here's the implication of this truth. If God shames and brings to nothing the things that are through people like you and me, then what that means is that God's selection of quote-unquote losers is a demonstration that he triumphs over those that the world would count as tremendous. It's a sign of his absolute power and You've got to be thinking. How could that ever be? How could that possibly be? The answer to how it could ever possibly be comes in the closing verses. Having explained who God chooses and talking about why he chooses them to put to shame the things that are in this upside-down kind of world, he then talks about the results of being chosen. Verses 30 through 31. Here's the amazing grace of God. In using people like us to shame the world, it's not just an external thing, but there's this internal grace and greatness. Verse 30. Notice what he says. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Friends, here's the good news I have for you this morning. The world might not think you're very much, but in Jesus, you've got everything you could ever imagine. It's not just something that shames the world, but it's actually, in Christ, what gives you everything you long for. We may not have much in ourselves, but we have everything in Him. It is as if you were selected off the street as an orphan, poor, dirty and despised, looking like nothing in the eyes of the world, and yet brought in and sat next to the king and given his food, given his authority, given his royalty and everything that comes from being a king. Friends, that's what you have in Jesus. You ask, how could this ever be? Simply put, the king who has given you everything shamefully hung on a cross to put the world to shame. That's how all of this comes into being. You see, as upside down as it and backwards as it is for God to use people like you and me, it is nothing in comparison to the way in which God enacts all of that. Because yes, it is backwards that God would put to shame the world the world is shame through people like us. But it's even more backwards that he would do it through the death of his own son on a cross. In the book of Mark, the 15th chapter, six times, they called Jesus king. Pilate, who judged him. The soldiers who beat him. The sign that marked him and the leaders who mocked him all truth even though all they thought they were doing was highlighting a lie yes friends Jesus is king and do you know from where he reigned as king on earth he reigned from the cross it is the only earthly throne on which Jesus ever sat 
This is the upside down nature of the gospel, friends. If that is, and I believe it is, and only it begins to make sense why God would use people like us. You see, because God just loves working in a backwards kind of way. So the next time you look in the mirror and go, why would God choose somebody like me? Or the next time you come to church and look around and go like, I don't know about this pack of losers. Then remember the gospel. And go, oh, well this is just the way God always loves to work. If with Jesus, then maybe with us. You see, our lowly status serves to magnify his might. Here in closing, Paul will say in verse 30, or 31, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here Paul is drawing from Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. It says this, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For these things, in these things I delight, declares the Lord. It's interesting that Paul's categories of persons matches the triplet we find in Jeremiah chapter 9. See, Jeremiah is in the middle of a series of oracles proclaiming doom and shame on all those who would boast in themselves which is exactly what the Corinthians were doing. Which is exactly the kind of thing that you and I are tempted to do. Boasting in our greatness. And Paul here is laying down a not-so-subtle warning to any who would long for worldly greatness. God has provided everything in Jesus, Paul saying. And Jesus puts the world to shame the world's standards by winning through death and choosing people of the not many, a league of mostly losers, boasting then and division and despising one another simply has no place in the church. In 1936, Germany did host the Summer Games. in Berlin, Germany. Hitler was present for most of it. And while he was trying to keep a lid on things, it was starting to leak out that Hitler despised people. It despised Jews and blacks. He wanted nothing to do with them. Unfortunately, there was an American who showed up by the name of Jesse Owens. An African American of other world and field talent. Owen won four gold medals as Hitler watched on. Owen was not just a fantastic athlete. He was a living example that defied Hitler's worldly standards, shattering any notion of Aryan superiority. Owens put Nazism to shame. The part of the story most people don't know, though, is that when Owens returned to the United States of America, the president didn't even invite him to the White House because he didn't want to shake his hand. Owens was despised in the eyes of the world, not just those far away, but those close to home. Yet, Owens could always look and say, but I've still got the four gold medals. Despised, yet victorious. Friends, some of you will win gold medals in life, though not many. Regardless, most of us, however well we might do in this life, will never be known by many people, and when we die, most people will forget us. But who needs gold medals when you're getting a crown of righteousness. From the best to the rest, 
all who are found in Christ will be crowned in royalty. Thank God that he chooses losers like us to show that he's Lord. Let's pray. God, we come before you as a people of the not many. As those who struggle to accept the fact that we probably won't ever amount to much. Help us to avoid trying to be something. Help us avoid biting and bickering with one another, trying to be better than our brothers and sisters. Help us to accept the difficult reality that you have always used what is backwards and upside down in the world to shame the strong. Help us to glory in the fact that though we might not be much, we have everything in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, I just want to um, read something to you from a paragraph from what we were studying a couple years back. It's about membership. So give me a chance here. My hands are kind of full. Um, this author says, I like the metaphor of membership. It's not membership as in a civic organization or a country club. It's a kind of membership given to us in 1 Corinthians 12. Now you are a body, now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Because I am a member of the body of Christ, I must be a functioning member, whether I am an eye, an ear, or a hand. As a functioning member, I will give, I will serve, I will minister, I will evangelize, I will study, I will seek to be a blessing to others. I will remember that if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. And uh, read this. Um, after reading that paragraph, I, I just wanted to let you know that Nancy Gray has asked to join us in fellowship as a member here, and we have heard her testimony of salvation. We know she participated in Believer's Baptism. Uh, she participated in membership classes as well as Bible studies in both English and Spanish, and we have seen her testimony of service to others in our church and in our community for the past couple of years, so I would like to recommend Nancy for membership. So, if you're out there, I have my glasses off. Um, all members who are in favor of accepting Nancy to the membership, please say yes. All opposed, no. Nancy, welcome to membership and fellowship with the believers at Bethany Baptist Church. We love you. Well, if you want to congratulate Nancy, you can go ahead and, and say um, hi to her and uh, welcome to the family. Right now, it's a responsibility and a privilege as well to be accountable to the Lord before, no, to the church before the Lord. Uh, so go ahead and do that, and that way we're dismissed. God bless you.